This is the Emanuel Hour. From the heart of the capital city, we bring you the church with the people in its heart, Emanuel Baptist Church. With our pastor, Dr. Rex M. Horn, Jr., bringing a Bible-based message with answers for today's needs. And the Emanuel Music Ministry and Sanctuary Choir, under the direction of Reverend Lynn Madden. Join us now for the Emanuel Hour. Father, as we begin this service this morning, we are so grateful for your mercy and your loving kindness that you show to us in so many ways. Father, we're grateful for the privilege and the opportunity of being able to come to this place at this time to worship you. And Father, as we sing your praises, as prayers are offered to you, as we hear from your word, we pray, Father, that we be obedient to your leadership in our, in our lives, that we'd be faithful to follow your direction for us. Father, thank you for this time that we can come and worship you. We pray that you would bless it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And the Lord is faithful to show us his direction. Hymn 54, Great is thy faithfulness. We sing the first and third stanzas.
my privilege to welcome you to the first service of the Lord's Day on this wonderful Sunday here at Emmanuel Baptist Church of Little Rock and we do welcome you we know that there are those who are guests and as always we are pleased to have guests in all of our services and as our men make their way through our sanctuary at this time we want to recognize you in this way if you're not a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church would you let us know that simply by raising your hand that we may give to you a visitor's card to tell you something about our church and if you would take the time to give us a little information about you. You'll take the card and fill it out and place it in our offering plate just a little later in this service. We would appreciate that and we encourage you to be a part of all that we do and all that we are here at Emmanuel. The Bible study hour will follow this hour of worship and we encourage you to be a part of all of these things. I also want to make several special recognitions at this time. As most of our church family knows, this afternoon there will be a reception held for Grover Hemphill Sr., who turns 100 years of age. Brother Hemphill is here in this service, and I'm going to ask him to stand. Grover Jr., will you have your father to stand there? And our people want to see where he is. 100 years old. And we are thankful for his service through all of the years. We also have with us today two gentlemen from KRK Channel 4. We're beginning this morning a live broadcast at this hour that is seen over much of our state. And we are pleased to have the opportunity to air our broadcast on Channel 4 Sunday after Sunday at this hour. We will be on most every Sunday of the year for which we are grateful 
and we're pleased to have representatives from Channel 4 with us today, and I would like to introduce them to you. We have Dean Henson, who is the general manager of Channel 4, and Bob Denman, who is the general sales manager. They're seated here toward the front. Men, would you stand so that our people could welcome you to the services of Emmanuel Baptist Church? And we look forward to this relationship together for many years. Now I would invite you to take your Bibles and let's stand together as we turn to Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 41. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 41, as we think this morning about the question, what is required of you? Would you follow as I read, beginning in verse 41 of Luke chapter 12? Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men's servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Would you look again at that last verse of Scripture, verse 48? Midway through the verse, there is a principle that is true in every arena of life. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. May the Lord open our hearts and give us minds and ears and hearts open to him today. You may be seated as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful for the day that is before us, for the privilege that we have and the freedom that we enjoy to worship you in a free church, in a free land. Father, how we pray today that this service would be a blessing to all those who are here and all those who join us by means of television. We thank you, our Father, for the opportunity that you've given us to preach the good news. We thank you as well, Father, for faithful men and women who have made our church great over 100 years. And so significant to me that Grover Hemphill Sr., celebrating 100 years upon this earth, would be with us on this morning. We pray you'll bless him and his son and his family. We thank you for his service throughout all the years. Father, we are mindful as well that we live in a world that is troubled where there are people that are hungry and that are dying both physically and spiritually. And Father, as we read the passage this morning, we recognize that we are among those to whom much has been given. And we pray that as we spend time before you today that we would commit ourselves to being wise and faithful stewards. Father, we pray for our country and for those who lead us. We pray for President Bush in the last days of his administration that you would continue to bless and use him in our world. We thank you for him. And we pray that as President-elect Clinton in just a few short days will assume this role within our country, that you would bless him and endue him with power and with your wisdom. And Father, help us never to cease to pray for all those in authority 
as you have admonished us in your word. Father, we pray for the work of this church here in this place, that you would cause us to renew our vision and our zeal, to do those things that would honor Christ and help people. And Father, we know this morning that you're aware of our personal needs and our personal desires. And we ask that you would work those things in accordance with your time and with your will. Father, give us strength for this hour. Forgive us where we fail you. And we thank you for the opportunity to come before you today. We pray that when we leave this place that we'll know that we have met before you and you have spoken to our hearts. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us stand and share hymn number two, Holy, 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 just now.
let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning at this special time in our service, acknowledging you as the creator of all things, the source of all great and wonderful blessings in our life. We thank you, Father, for these blessings, for this church, but most of all, for the privilege of giving back to you a portion of that that you've given us with your great and boundless love. Father, we pray that you will use it, bless the giver and the gift, that it will be for the glory of your kingdom and the praise of your son, Jesus, in whose precious name I pray. Amen. I am pleased that you've joined us for the Emmanuel Hour today. Every Sunday morning, we're on for a full hour as we broadcast live our 8.30 service from the Emmanuel Baptist Church of Little Rock. We are so grateful for the opportunity to come week by week into your home. We know that we're going into areas, communities that we have not been on before, and we'd like to hear from you. You can help us simply by dropping us a note at this address and letting us know that you're getting the Emmanuel Hour in your community. Our church looks upon this as a ministry that we can perform for the people of our state, and we want you to know that you're important to us and our services. Worship with us in Little Rock when you're in town, or join us every Sunday morning at this hour.
in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 41, we have a question of Simon Peter, who true to form expressed a question that was likely on the hearts of a number of the people, particularly disciples. Jesus had been teaching them about true riches, and about the fact that he would come again, and upon his coming, he would like to find his people faithful so that they might sit at the table together and that he might serve them. So Peter asked the question in verse 41, what does this parable mean? And do you speak this parable to us, that is the 12? Do you speak this parable to all believers? Are you using this parable for all people, believer and unbeliever alike? To whom do you speak the parable? And certainly, Peter knew that he was included in the number who were being addressed. As I read the parable today, I believe that the parable speaks to those of privilege. As you read it, you cannot help but see the themes come to the surface about those who have been given much, those to whom much has been committed, to the people of privilege, people like you and me. The best approach, in my opinion, to this parable is to look upon it and ask the question, what is required of us? That is, what does Jesus want to see exhibited in the life of believers? What is it that he looks to see in your life and in my life? What traits, what characteristics? A parable was never given to be complex. It was always given so that a truth might be easily understood. So we do not need to dig too deeply in order to find the truths that Jesus expressed to the disciples then and to disciples today, particularly the privileged like you and me. So let's answer the question simply. What is required of you? The first thing that I find in verses 42 through 44 is that the Lord is saying we are to be active in work. Active in his work. Who then is that faithful and wise steward? Faithful, trustworthy, wise, thoughtful. Who is that trustworthy and thoughtful steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household? to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed, happy is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. Jesus had said in verse 37, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. That we are looking for his coming. And yet as he explains the parable to Peter, he says to him, now what I want to find in you is not merely that you are watching for my return, but that you are working as I return. If you are blessed for watching, how much more for working? Jesus would be saying, I do not want you to give yourself merely to calculations of when I will return. But I want you to give yourself in faithful and diligent behavior to serve until I come. Yes, watching for his return, but working in his service. What is required of you? That you work. That you are a faithful and wise steward. The word wise also could be translated skillful. A skillful steward. A sagacious steward a faithful, thoughtful steward. That's what he looks for. Would you look with me at two words in describing our work? The first one is found in verse 42. It is the word steward, the trusty household manager. In the day that Jesus lived, the owner of a home or of some acreage would likely turn the authority over his home to a faithful household steward. And it would not be that the, that the owner would forget about his possessions, but when he found that faithful steward, he would give himself over to that steward and trust that person to carry out 
the day-to-day -day operations of that estate. But when you look at the word household, you find that it comes from a root word, therapeuo. You can hear our word, therapy. Household, therapy, therapeuo. In Luke chapter 9 and in verse 11, the people, when they knew it, followed him. And he received them and spake unto them of the kingdom of God and healed them that had need of healing. The word healing in chapter 9, verse 11, is our word, therapeuo, therapy, household. Look at it in that light. Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, over those people there? And what is included in that household? We are the household of God. In speaking about working as his requirement, we began to see a word about healing. Now, what do those in the medical profession do? Most of us here are laymen when it comes to the medical profession, though there are a number of physicians and those involved in medical services. But how would we describe what the medical profession is to do? We would say they observe a need. There's something wrong in a physical body, and they observe that need. Then they address the need. Not only observing it, but addressing the need. And then minister to that need according to the resources and supply that is at their disposal. And that is not all. Then they expect the person to do better. Their condition of life to improve. When you begin to think of the requirement of the Lord as a Christian or as a church, you begin to see, don't you, that there is a healing calling. We too are to observe needs and we are to address those needs. Then we are to minister to those needs out of the supply that God has given us and then expect an improvement, life to improve, people's condition to improve. What is required of you? That you be a faithful steward that you be involved in healing of the needs of our world. But then we find in verse 43, the word servant. I like this verse. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find, look at the last words, so doing, doing, actively working, not passively waiting, doing. Blessed is that servant, happy is the servant, that when the Lord comes, he finds you doing. Seeing needs, addressing needs, ministering to people, expecting things to do better and life to improve. Blessed is that servant. We are to announce good news to a hurting world. We are to minister to the needs that we observe. We are to help where we can, not according to our riches, but according to his riches. That is what is required of us. Then the Lord said of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. Make ruler in the Greek language is one word. It means to place down or to designate. The person who is a faithful steward, that happy servant that Jesus sees working because it's required, he will place him down. He will designate him as a ruler. The Bible tells us in the first place about him making him ruler, that he will do so in trusting his house to him. Verse 42, make ruler over his household. But in verse 44, he will make ruler over all that he has, property and possessions, all that he has. It is saying this, as is true throughout Scripture, if you are faithful in little, he will make you ruler over much. If you're taking care of things now in your realm of influence, if you're actively working in the world and you see needs and you address them and you minister to them one-on-one, -on -one, then God will continue to increase the sphere of your influence. What is required of you? We are to be active in the work. Then in verses 45 and following, not only are we to be active in the work, 
we are to accept his will. In verse 47, that servant which knew his Lord's will, will meaning purpose, pleasure, the one who knows God's purpose and pleasure, what God expects of us, the person who knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. Some key words as we think about accepting his will. That first word that I've mentioned, will. Pleasure and purpose. We are to know his purposes and his pleasure. Then we look at the word worthy, suitable or deserving. When we know his purpose and pleasure, he will look upon us and reward us and give us what is worthy, what is suitable, and what we've deserved. And he talks about of people of privilege, there will be much required, the word required meaning sought and demanded. So when we begin to think of ourselves as people of privilege, I hope that your heart is quickened by the Word of God to see that if there are any people mentioned in Luke chapter 12, verses 41 through 48, is the people to whom I am speaking today. We are privileged people. We are to be faithful stewards, happy servants, because we of all people have been instructed in the purposes and the pleasure of God. We know, don't we, what God expects from us in the world in which we live. Which leads me to make two statements. The first in accepting his will is to see and acknowledge our place of privilege. The implication in these verses, beginning in verse 45, servant says in his heart my Lord delayeth his coming is that Jesus was saying yes I may tarry and there's a great chance that I will and because Jesus tarries his coming many people look upon it and say he'll not come and so after a while they give themselves to self-indulgence rather than self-denial and we become callous rather than Christ-like and we take the Word of God has been done for centuries now and reform it and revise it with our own devices because we have trouble explaining about his coming again and that really in this sophisticated culture of ours that Jesus Christ the Son of God is going to interrupt and bring a halt to all things and return in majesty and glory and honor it just doesn't fit with the modern mind and so we go about our way making our choices and making our decisions even though we are people of privilege in a place of privilege. Doug Sherman lives in our city, has written a number of books about people in the workplace. He's a graduate of the Air Force Academy and was an instructor in the advanced jet training program for a number of years, now involved in ministry to people in the workplace. In one of his books, he recounted what he said was were the two biggest lies perpetrated in the Air Force. And he explained it like this, the word would come down that a team of inspectors were coming to the base to make sure everything in the base and the people measured up. So the people would begin to work putting a double shine on their shoes and boots, cleaning up the base, painting, getting ready for the team of inspectors. He said the first lie was given when the commander of the inspection team stepped off the plane and said, we're here to help you. He said the second lie quickly followed when the wing commander of the base said, we're glad you're here. He said after they left that soon the base and the people were not as diligently watching or prepared as they were prior to the announcement that the inspection team was soon to come. When Jesus comes, there is no further warning going to be given than that which is given in Scripture. And we are to be working, we are to be watching, but we also are to see ourselves 
as privileged people in this world and that we occupy a place of privilege. Therefore, when Jesus comes to judge the world, he will judge us by the knowledge that we have and by the level of commitment that we have evidenced with all the privileges that we have enjoyed. Is that a frightening thing to you? That of all the people in the world, the believers in America will be held to a different standard than any other believers in the world. I believe that, don't you? Can you show me a people that have been more blessed, more prosperous, a proliferation of Bibles and the gospel and books and tapes and programs throughout our nation? Has any people been more privileged? Has more knowledge been at our disposal? And how, because of this level of blessing and privilege, do we come as far as the level of performance? Are we as committed and dedicated as those believers in third world countries? Those behind the previous iron curtain, have we given ourselves, our substance, even our lives for the cause of the one who one day will come and desires to sit at the table with us and to serve us and to make us rulers? We occupy a place of privilege, which leads to the second statement. There will be justice in his judgment. We are privileged because of words we read like there's been much given, much committed, or committed much to us. There's justice in judgment when we read words such as verse 48, but he that knew not. There are those who do not have the knowledge that we have. In the household, the faithful steward was to pass instructions on down to the other servants. We are, those faithful stewards are to be. We've been given the information and we are to pass them on down to others. There is justice in his judgment. The one who knew not and is worthy, deserving of stripes, the Bible said he will be beaten with few stripes. The one that doesn't have that much. Now understand, as Farrar said, there is no such thing as absolute moral ignorance. In the book of Romans, if you would look there for just a moment, you find listed for us this fact, this truth, that there is no such thing as absolute moral ignorance. In chapter 1, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, that is creation, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In Romans chapter 2, verse 14, for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. But listen particularly now to verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. There is justice in judgment, not a person that does not have creation and conscience bearing witness. But not everybody has the same light that we have and enjoy. Do you ever watch the newscast and see the faces and the empty eyes of children and the starving in places like Somalia. And you live in your homes that are beautifully appointed, eating more than we need, and watching the pain of a nation around the world. Do you ever stop and think, God, why not me? Why not us? Is it because we are more valuable to God than they are. Does it mean that people who live in Little Rock are worth more to God than people who live in Somalia? Does it mean that God loves us more, that Jesus died for us and did not care for those in other parts of the world? Well, absolutely not. What does it mean? Well, there are a lot of things we don't understand. But this we can understand. We are privileged and blessed and we shall be judged based upon the light that we have. And the light that we have is as the sun that is bright in its glory. And so many people in the world in comparison 
live in a world of darkness. There is justice in judgment. Again, verse 48, the one who knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. We are to remember. In Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus, the beggar died and went to heaven. The rich man died and went to hell, not because of his riches, but because of his unbelief. And he looked and he saw Lazarus and he said, Father Abraham, send him to cool my thirst. I am tormented. And the words that came were these, Son, remember. Son, remember. Call to mind that you in your lifetime had good things and he had evil things, but now he enjoys good things while you are tormented. May God help us not to come to the end of our lives and stand before Jesus Christ in judgment and for him to ask us, why didn't you do more with what I had entrusted to you while those who had nothing gave all that they had for my cause? Remember, remember where you lived and what you had and what you knew and the opportunities that I presented before you. Remember, we have been given much. Much is required of us. We are the ones who will be worthy, not of a few stripes, but to be beaten and counted with the unfaithful. The word faithful and unfaithful in the Greek language is the same except for the A prefix. And so close it seems to me that that's the way it is in life. Just a step here, a step there that makes us trustworthy or untrustworthy. Faithful or unfaithful. So we'll give an account. And I don't want you to sit here this morning and think, well, what will take place is I'll be judged if I do wrong. That's the way we've grown up. That's the way we've often preached. That's the way we've led people to think. You're only judged if you do wrong. No. You're also judged if you don't do what's right. It's not enough to say I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do this. That's not what Christ is interested in. He wants to know what are we going to do. How much are we going to give? How much of our life are we going to expend for him? To the one who knows to do right and does not. The Bible says in the book of James chapter 4, to him it is sin. We encourage our children, don't we? You read them the little engine that could. You tell them in school, you can do it. You tell them in athletics, you can accomplish that. We encourage them and we should. We should never tell them, you're a miserable student. You have no talent, no ability. That's not the way to treat a child. And yet it needs to be shown to them that in the cause of Christ, we're all helpless and powerless and poor and miserable and sinful. It could be illustrated like this. A man is charged with a heinous crime of murder. And his bail is set at five million dollars. Is that because he is so valuable that they say he's worth five million dollars? No, it's because he's so criminal. And to say that Jesus died for me, does that mean that I am so valuable? No, it means that I am so sinful. That nothing less than the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had to be shed for my life. In order that I might be saved. What is required of you? To be active in his service, accept his will. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll take the word this morning and apply it to our hearts, cause us to be all that we should be. For Jesus' sake, I pray. Amen. Just a moment, we sing a hymn of invitation. And as we sing this hymn of invitation, we invite you in the balcony of the, the main floor to come to make your decision has been a for blessing Christ. to your life. It could be today Sometimes that you the would messages come. from God's Word serve as a great challenge to us, for we recognize that we do not have that kind of relationship with God that we know we need and that truly we desire to have. You may be there and simply say, I know that I don't have the relationship with God that I should have. Well, I have good news for you. 
You see, in preaching God's Word, the, even the word preach means to announce good news of what God has already done for you through Jesus Christ the Lord. Your responsibility and mine is simply to accept what God has done and then submit our lives to Him. We do so by receiving His gift, a gift that's already purchased, the price already paid, and now you receive from God's hand that which He has done for you in Jesus Christ. Dear friend, today, if you'll just simply invite Jesus Christ into your heart, just tell Him of your need and ask Him to come in and to be your Savior and Lord. He will. I sometimes say this, if you'll do that, He'll do His part. If you will, He will. Ask Him in and He'll come in. I'd also like to tell you that you can have a copy of today's message on an audio tape. If you'd simply write us or call us here at Emanuel Baptist Church, we'll send you that tape. There is no charge. It is what we want to give to you. Or perhaps you'd like our tape catalog to tell you of other messages that have been preached here. We'd be glad to send you a tape catalog and any tape that you'd request. May the Lord bless you. And if we can be of any ministry to you, you please call on us. Ten days from now, a citizen of our state and a resident of our city and a member of our church will be sworn in as the President of the United States. He's been a member of our church since 1980, and during that time, you have known him as Bill Clinton, as Governor Bill Clinton, and soon to be President Clinton. We know that our responsibility of all church families across the nation is to pray for him as the Bible admonishes us to do in several places, among them Romans chapter 13, that we are to pray and that we are to pray daily as I have challenged you and have committed myself to do. And we're going to do that. Surely no Christian people in the world should take more interest in what takes place in the life of this one whose life has forever been impacted not only by the election of the office, but I believe by the ministry of this church as well. I have asked the president-elect if he would at this time to share a few words with us, a few thoughts with us, as this is his last Sunday with us prior to the inauguration. We do look for him time to time in the days to come as he returns home, and he's going to share a few words with us now, and I know you'll give attention as President-elect Bill Clinton comes to share a word with us. Thank you very much. On a very cold morning 14 years ago this week, I came to this church to have the dedicatory service for my first term as governor of Arkansas. Every service since then, for any public office I have held until the one which will be held in Washington next week, has been held in this church. And that is as it should be for, as Rex Horn said, I became a member of Emmanuel in 1980. And then I joined the choir. I went by to say goodbye to the choir this morning and I told them that being a part of this choir is one of the great pleasures of my entire life. I only stopped when the campaign and then my lost voice seemed to dictate that I ought to be out there instead of up here messing it up. I, I was thinking just a moment ago if I could sing like Jack Blackshire I would have been in a different line of work today. <laughs> you have been my church home. You have been my friends. But most important by far 
This is a place where I have come to seek divine guidance and support and reassurance. Were it not for this church, beginning with the bond I struck with Dr. Vaught so long ago and continuing all these years, I think it is virtually impossible that I would be going to Washington next week to become president. And I am absolutely certain that I would be much less prepared for the job. I want to say a special word of thanks to Rex Horn. I'm sure when he came here, he never anticipated all the ups and downs of being the pastor to somebody who was fool enough to want to be president. But he was always there, constantly, in good times and bad, with a call, with a prayer, with a friendly arm. I want to thank him for standing by me and my membership in this church, even when people in our own Southern Baptist Convention questioned his doing so. I want to thank the staff here and all the members of this church for enduring the protest and the spotlight that go with national politics today and for always making me feel at home here, even in the darkest days of my campaign. Next Sunday, I will begin the day in the home of Thomas Jefferson, and then I will go to worship in a historic church. Thomas Jefferson, having been president, having authored the Declaration of Independence, asked that on his tombstone he have only two things, that he founded the University of Virginia and that he authored the Virginia Statutes of Religious Liberty. Our church, the Baptist Church, has always believed in religious liberty and believed in the constitutional mandate to respect the religion of every American but to embrace none in the law. That does not mean we should take our values or our principles out of our politics. None of us can or should do that. But it does mean we should bring a great humility when bringing moral judgments to others in public life. Because you have treated me in this way, even when you disagreed with me, I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart, for myself and for my family. I ask you now to pray for me. You know the world is still a very dangerous and uncertain place, and our country is mired in deep difficulty. But that is simply the challenge of this time. Every generation of Americans has been called upon to face some challenge. And with the will and help of God, we have endured now for more than 200 years. With God's help and your prayers, I will do my best. Thank you and God bless you all.